But now let me show you what's going what's going on in this experiment. Okay. Instead, let's say we, you know, let's say we picked instead of 10 marbles, we picked a thousand marbles. Okay. Let me show you what's going on in this experiment. But in order to show you what's going on in this experiment, we must realize that, you know, when we do this experiment once, you know, random things can happen. So let's imagine we repeat this experiment over and over and over again. So pick a thousand marbles. Okay. Look at the fraction of red. Pick an, uh, replace them. Pick again, thousand marbles. Look at the fraction of red. Replace them. Pick again, pick again, pick again. So repeat this experiment many, 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 many times. Okay. So let me show you what can possibly happen. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw on the x-axis. I'm going to draw the possible values of new. Okay, from zero to one. So when I draw a thousand marbles, it's possible that I get zero red. It's possible that I get a thousand red. And it's possible for me to get pretty much anything in between at a resolution of 0 0.001. Now here's where mu sits. So mu is 0 0.4. Okay. Now let's say I do this experiment once. Okay, do it once and I see what value of, uh, of, of nu did I get. Maybe I got 0.3. So I'll, you know, I'll put a little check mark there. I'll put a little X mark here. So let's say this is point, well, let, I won't get point three. I might get, let's say, point three nine. Okay, so I'll put a little X mark here. Okay, now let me re repeat it. Maybe I get point four. So I'll put a little X mark here. Okay, maybe I get point four one. I'll put an X mark here. Okay, maybe I get, I'll repeat it again. So I get point four. And I get point four, point four, point three nine. And point three nine, point four, point three nine nine, point four zero one. 0 0.401, 0.401, 0.404, 0.4, 0.4, 0.399, 0.399, 0.399, 0.401, and so on. I get things that are very close to 0.4, okay? And I get things that are, you know, but occasionally I might get, you know, something out here. Occasionally. And occasionally I might get something out here. I might get a new equals to 0.5, okay? But then I'll get mostly guys that are in here. These guys will happen most of the time, okay? And, and so on. Okay, and so on, and I'll get a few here. Okay, maybe occasionally I'll get one here, one here, one here, one here. Okay, so this is an example of my, what might happen if I repeated this experiment many, 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 many times. Okay, what it shows you is that, you know, yes, it's possible to get all possible values of mu. Okay, in which case, you cannot really in, uh, infer anything about mu because you can get mu equals zero, you can get mu equals one, and in these cases, mu is not close to new, but most of the time when I repeat this experiment, I'm in a world, okay, that's good. Okay, most of the time you will find that new is very, very, very close to mu, especially if you sample a thousand. In fact, if you repeat this experiment, you know, and, 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 and take it to the limit, you know, you, you find what's called a very, very spiked distribution that looks something like this. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And now this distribution has a name. It's called a binomial. Okay. And because we are sampling, our sample size is so large, n equals a thousand, this is approximate, it is well approximated by a Gaussian. Okay. And now I want to highlight two kinds of things that can happen. A good thing can happen when I run this experiment. Okay. So imagine that if the new that I get is within, let's say, epsilon of mu. Okay. So in, in this region, okay, so, you know, if, if, if new happens to fall in this region, which is, let's say, mu plus some small value epsilon and mu minus some small value epsilon, I'll say a good thing happened. The sample was good. Okay. So this is good. Okay. And then there's the other thing that can happen, which is the sample is bad. Okay. So the sample is bad. Okay. So in this good, in this good outcome, okay, nu minus mu is less than or equal to epsilon. Okay. So nu is a, is tightly linked to mu. And if I were, if I were in this good world, if, if, if a good thing had happened, okay, then, and, and I made the claim that, you know, mu is equal to nu, then I wouldn't be far off. Okay. On the other hand, a bad thing can happen, and it's possible that a bad thing can happen. So, so in this region, bad. And in this region, bad. Okay, and you'll see what's going on in this region, though. You know, in this region, if, if my sample happened to be such that, you know, nu is far from mu, and I claimed, 
you know, I believe the Gallup poll, I claim that, okay, mu is the observed value of mu, let's say 0.6, I would be far off, I would be wrong. So in this bad world, I cannot believe the Gallup poll. I cannot look at the Gallup poll and claim that mu is equal to that value. Okay, so in this bad world, uh, nu minus mu is greater than epsilon. Mu minus mu is greater than epsilon. Okay. Okay. So there's the good world, and then there's the bad world. And the bad world is possible. Okay. But when you look at this picture, you see that by far, it's overwhelmingly more likely that I'm in the good world and that I can, you know, conclude by after observing mu that, you know, that's the value of mu. And if, and, and with an overwhelmingly high likelihood, I will be correct. Okay. And that's why we believe Gallup polls. Okay. Not because they are always right, but because, you know, almost all the time, you, they, they will be right. Okay. And if n becomes very, very large, it's almost a probability one that the, the Gallup poll will be right, but there is still a small probability that it can be wrong. Okay. And if you're in this Gallup poll world where the Gallup poll is very far off, then you're a very, very, very unlucky person. Don't ever buy a lottery ticket. Okay. So, can we pin this down mathematically? Can we pin down this picture mathematically? And the answer is yes. Okay. And it is a gift from Hufting. And now I'm going to just state the gift from Hufting and I'm going to go through it slowly because it is a complicated formula, but it is a very, 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 very important formula. Okay. So. A gift from Hufting. Wassily Hufting. A gift. From Hufting. Okay. Now, okay, the reason we believe in this Gallup poll and in sampling in general is because we believe that the good thing happens very, very often. Okay. Or we believe that the bad thing happens with a very low probability, almost zero. Okay. And that's what Hufting was able to show. But he wasn't able to compute this probability because it's a complicated binomial. But what he was able to show was an upper bound on this probability. So Huffing came and said, you know what? The probability when you run this experiment that you'll be in a bad situation. So the probability that you will be in a bad situation. Okay, now what does bad mean? The bad means that, you know, you would be very wrong if you claimed that the population fraction of red is equal to the observed sample fraction of red. So bad means that the probability, you know, the bad thing happens if nu minus mu is greater than epsilon. So that's what bad means. Okay. So he said that the probability that you're in a bad situation, i.e. the probability that these guys deviate a lot and then the first question you should say, whoa, 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 what is this epsilon? And that's what's interesting in this bound, in this, in this, in this Hufting bound. Well, that's up to you to define what bad means. Okay. So if you observed nu equals 0 0.63. Okay. And you know, uh, you said that mu, so therefore you conclude mu equals 0 0.63, but then you find out that mu equals 0 0.7. Okay. So then the deviation between these two in absolute value, the deviation is 0 0.07. Is that good or bad? Are you happy or sad? Okay. And, 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 and so it's up to you to define what level of deviation you're willing to live with. I.e., it's up to you to define what this epsilon is. And okay, a typical choice for epsilon might be something like, you know, 0 0.1. Okay, so this is a relatively, you know, you know, you're a, you're a relatively lax guy. Okay, you know, if you said that mu, if you said that mu is 0 0.6 and the actual value is 0 0.5, you're happy. You're not sad. Okay, 10% off. Okay, okay. Another typical choice for epsilon is 0 0.05. So you're willing to tolerate a 5% deviation in, in your estimate, in your inference. You're, you're willing to tolerate a 5% error. And another popular choice is epsilon equals 0 0.01. So 1%. So if you claim that it's, you know, for, that, the, that the population fraction is 0 0.4 and it's actually 0 0.39, no problem. But if it's 0 0.38, you're not happy. Okay. 
Okay. That's a pretty strict, you know, requirement. You have very high standards. Okay. But it's up to you. You define what it means to be bad. Okay. So what it means, it means to be bad. Okay. And then this is exactly the definition of a bad situation. And what Hafting said, that the probability of a bad situation is small. That's what he said. Okay. But now, of course, he's a mathematician. He didn't just say small. Okay. So to show that something is small, we're going to show that it's less than or equal to something small. And you're going to show that it's less than or equal to something small. And then what's, 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 you know, a parameter in this sampling problem that we could use in order to control how small something is? Well, the number of data points is certainly uh, a valid candidate because, you know, we, we certainly are believing more and more in the Gallup poll when the size of the sample gets larger and larger. And indeed, that is the case. Okay. Indeed, you know, this something small gets smaller and smaller as the sample size gets larger and larger. In fact, it gets much smaller when the sample size gets larger and larger. In fact, it's behaving exponentially with n. It's, so it's, this probability of a bad situation is at most, you know, e to some power which is negative of n. So there's n in the exponent. So for example, if you have 10, if you have 10 data points, this would be e to the minus 10 e to the minus 10. If you have a thousand data point, this is e to the minus a thousand. Wow. e to the minus a thousand. Forget about it. You know, the chances of it happening, uh, you know, if you wait for a bad thing to happen, if the chances of a bad thing happening are e to the minus a thousand, the universe will be gone by then. Okay. So e to the minus n. Okay. Well, unfortunately, there's bad news. Okay. Because you can look here, you see that certainly it should depend on what it means to be bad. If you're more strict, then the, the, the chances of a bad thing happening should go up. And indeed, that's the case. Bad news. Okay, there's an epsilon squared here. Okay, so it's e to the minus epsilon squared. And now you can see that this is really bad news. Because with epsilon equals 0 0.1, this number becomes, you know, 0 0.01. Okay? And so for this exponent to become large, you need n much, much greater than 1 over epsilon squared. If epsilon is 0 0.01, you need n much, much bigger than, you know, 10,000. Okay, so you need to sample at least 10,000, maybe 100,000. Okay, if you sample 100,000, then this becomes e to the minus 10. Wow, that's a small number. Okay, well, that's not quite correct either. Now we have some technical issues. So you have to put a 2 here, you have to put a 2 here. Okay. And now it's technically correct. So the form of the bound e to the minus epsilon squared n is roughly speaking correct and has all the right dependent. But, you know, there, there's a certain value to being truly mathematically correct. And, 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 and we have to put in those two. Okay, so now that's the bound. Okay. And that's the quantification of is small. So the probability of a bad thing happening is small. What's a bad thing? If you were to say that, you know, your observed nu is mu, you would be wrong. Then you're in a bad situation. And if that value is very, very small, then we can believe the Gallup poll. We can believe the sampling. Okay. And, and, and that's the picture that goes along with that formula, that bound. Okay. Um, sometimes it's nice to know also what's the probability that you're right. What's the probability of a good thing happening? Okay. And that's just the complement event. So when will you be correct in, 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 in ascribing mu to nu? So in inferring that, you know, mu is nu. So this is the probability that nu minus mu is less equal to epsilon. And that's at least, it's a complement event. So it's at least 1 minus 2 e to the minus 2 epsilon squared. I'm going to box this. So we're going to spend a little bit of time discussing it. Okay. okay. So, one thing you might observe that's missing from the right-hand side here is mu. Okay. So, in order to compute this bound, in order to compute the probability of a bad thing happening, Okay. In order to upper bound it, I need epsilon, which I get to set, 
and I need n, which again is indirectly set by me by you know by choosing the size of the sample. So I need to know epsilon and n. What about mu? Okay. So I can compute this bound ahead of time before picking the sample. Okay, and I can see what size n do I need in order to make this small enough so that I'm comfortable. So in other words, the probability of a bad thing happening is small. Okay. And then I can go and pick the sample of that particular size n, okay, given my epsilon that I chose. And then I look at mu and I claim that mu is equal to that. And, you know, with very high probability, I will be correct. Okay. Correct modulo this epsilon deviation. But where is mu in here? It's not there. It's not a typo. There is no mu in here. So in other words, I can calculate this bound without knowing mu. Okay. So mu is absent. Okay. And I want to emphasize and re-emphasize how important that is. Okay. Because if mu was in here, I couldn't compute that bound and I wouldn't be able to compute the, the, the satisfactory n that will give me a low enough probability of that. And why is that? For the simple reason that I don't know mu. Okay. So this is fantastic because I don't know mu. Another thing that's missing from this whole picture is the size of the bin. Size of the bin. size of the bin. Okay. How many people are you uh, uh, talking about in the US? 350 million, could be a billion, could be a trillion, could be infinite. Okay. There's no size of the bin in here. That means that this gift from hufting, this hufting bound applies to the bin no matter what its size. Actually, the bin could have size 1, 2, 3, 5, 100, 100 million, infinity. The size of the bin is irrelevant. What matters is not the size of the bin, but the size of the sample. And that's the only size that comes in here. That's very crucial. Okay. So I'm just pointing out some properties of this bound. In fact, the, the fact that the, 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 the unknown population fraction mu is not part of the bound, even though it's part of defining what makes a situation bad or good. So it's part of defining that is not in the bound. That's a miracle. The size of the bin is not in the bound, but what is in the bound is the sample size and the tolerance you get to pick. So let's look at some examples. Okay, so example. <clears throat> okay. So suppose n, so let, let the sample size be uh, Mm, 1,000. Okay. And let's consider two situations. Okay. So, n, so n equals 1,000. Okay. Then, if your epsilon is 0 0.05, so epsilon is 0 0.05, so that means that Nu minus 0 0.05 is less equal to mu, is less equal to nu plus 0 0.05. Okay. So my deviation is 0 0.05. Okay. So then when I run the experiment, okay, and I get my sample of size 1000, and then I look at the fraction of red marbles, i.e. I compute nu, okay, this will be the case 99.5. Uh, let's see, 99 point, well, 99% of the time. Okay. So what is this? This is, you know, so this is a good thing. Okay. So this number is 1 minus okay, twice e to the minus twice 0 0.05 squared times 1,000. And you can just compute it. Okay. And you'll find that 99% of the time, okay, when I observe mu, it'll be the case that mu is within 0 0.05 of the observed mu. What about if I relax my, you know, my, if, if, if I relax my condition, if I'm less stringent, okay, if epsilon equals 0 0.1, okay, then the number I want here is 1 minus 2 e to the minus 2 0 0.1 squared times 1,000. Okay. Now, 0 0.1 squared is 
1 over 100. So this becomes e to the minus 20. So we are already guessing that this is a tiny, tiny number. Okay, and then when you do 1 minus that, it's basically 1. Okay. In fact, 99.9999. And let's see how many 9s do I have. 1, 2, 3, uh, 6 9s. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 9s. And then a 6. So 99.9999996% of the time. Nu minus 0 0.1 is within mu, is, is less equal to mu, less equal to nu plus 0 0.1. So what that means is that, you know, if my sample size is a thousand, it doesn't matter what mu is. I pick a sample of size thousand and let's say the value of nu is 0.6. Okay, so I say mu is 0.6. Well, mu, 99, basically 100% of the time, mu will be between 0.5 and 0.7. Okay, because my, my error in deviation here is 0.1. Okay. And can you live with that chance of being correct? Most people could live with that. 99.99999. Even that, 99% of the time, you're within 5% of the true value. Even that is livable. Okay. Shows you the power of sampling. Okay. And effectively what's going on here, effectively what's going on here is that new is what I observe, okay? I observe mu and then I say, mm, I'm going to conclude that mu is approximately equal to nu. I'm going to conclude that. Okay? And this is how often I will be right. You know, I want to just make a small technical, you know, comment that, you know, in this experiment, you know, mu is fixed. It's nu that varies. Okay, so nu varies. And the probability, you know, Whenever you talk about a probability, there's something that's random. It's new that's random, and new and, and, and new is randomly varying. But it's just that most of the time, okay, the new will be close to mu. But there's a new slash here that if new is close to mu, then mu is close to new. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Technically, it's mu is fixed. It's new that's varying. Okay, but you know we observe new, and then we 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 see that most of the time we're in a good world in which we can reach from inside the data, i.e. reach from mu, and estimate mu, which is outside the data. Okay, so in this simple example, we see that it is possible to reach from inside the data to outside the data. And I want to summarize the conditions that are absolutely essential for us to be able to do that. So, when does new reach from in the data to outside the data to give us new? So, let's try to sort of summarize this discussion in a set of best practices, a set of, 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 and in some cases, they're not just best practices, but they are essential practices. Okay. So one, the sample is picked randomly. Okay. The sample is picked randomly. So not adversarially. And you can see how, you know, for example, if you don't pick randomly, none of these kinds of conclusions can occur. Okay. So if your sample is not picked randomly, sometimes we say that you know, there might be something that's called a sampling bias. But if the sample is not picked randomly, then, you know, imagine I carefully select all the Trump voters. So I carefully select all the red marbles. Then my sample is going to be red. And it says nothing about mu. It could be that most of my voters are green. Okay, most of my marbles are green. So the sample is picked randomly. Okay, that is essential. Okay. So that's the first thing that allows, you know, that is required for allowing new to reach from inside the data and tell us about new outside the data. The second thing is that, you know, we gave up the notion of for sure. Okay. So it's always possible that new is wrong, okay. but we're in this world of high probability. So, you know, we gave up 
for sure. So we're in a world of high probability. So you can only reach from inside the, in this specific example, you can only reach from inside the data to outside the data, okay, never for sure, but with high probability. Sometimes we say this is, you know, a probably approximately correct model, PAC. So it's probably approximately correct to say that nu is mu. So probably because it's with high probability and approximately because you have to have this epsilon. You cannot set epsilon to zero. Okay. So you're with high probability approximately correct. Okay. So we gave up the for sure. So the sample is picked randomly. Technically, the term we use for that is IID, independently and identically distributed. So each uh, marble is in IID sample from the bin. Okay. We gave up the for sure, so we're in this world of high probability. Okay. And how do we get into this world of high probability? We want as large a sample size as possible. N is large. Okay, so the larger the sample size, the more faith we have in the in, in, in the high probability nature of the conclusion. And the specific quantification of what's the probability that you're in the good world is this, or what's the probability that you're in the bad world is this. So it's related to e to the minus epsilon squared n up to some constants. Okay, so epsilon squared n, so your approximate, you know, criterion, so your epsilon squared times n should be large. More specifically, epsilon squared n should be large. So if you want to make a much stricter, tighter conclusion about mu, you're going to need a correspondingly larger n. Um, I will uh, I will state one more um, requirement. And you're going to look at me and, wow, that's so obvious. This guy is insulting my intelligence. Okay. But I'm just going to state it anyway, so bear with me. Four. When you take the sample satisfying conditions one, two, and three, okay, when you take the sample satisfying conditions one, two, and three, you get a new. Okay, you can only apply that new to make an inference about the bin. So to make an inference about mu for the bin, from which that sample came. So new reaches out to mu for that same bin. And you look at me and say, wow, does this guy think that we are, we are so dumb that we don't know that? So what am I saying? I'm saying that if you, if you, Take a poll of people in Australia and ask them, you know, would you would you vote for Trump or would you vote for Biden? And then you get a, you know, you get a fraction of Trump supporters in Australia. And then you try to infer from that that, you know, Trump is going to win the election in the U.S., which is based on U.S. voters. Good luck. OK, you're taking a new that is constructed from a sample from bin A and trying to apply it to bin B. No, no. OK, and that looks so obvious. You say, wow, you, had, you really had to state that. Well, believe it or not. Most of the total screw-ups in machine learning arise from that mistake. You take a sample from one bin and you try to apply it to another bin. Okay. And that mistake shows up in various subtle ways, okay, which we will see. Okay. But I'm stating it and you look at me like I'm some kind of out of space guy, but you know, you can't argue with me. Okay. And I, and I would like to emphasize this. Okay. But now I want to show you some of the generality of this ability to reach outside. It doesn't matter what mu is. Okay. So mu, so you know, generality. For all, for any mu, so it doesn't matter what the true population fraction is, and for any bin size, for any bin, And this is going to be important. So as long as I can take any problem I want and put it into this abstract framework for any bin and for any mu, nu reaches out to mu, okay, providing that I satisfy criteria one, two, three, and four. So I sample my, I pick my sample, you know, independently, IID, randomly. Okay, I've given up 
for sure, and I'm willing to live in a high probability world. Okay, and you know, um, I've picked a large enough sample so that the Huffing bound gives me a small enough probability of a bad thing happening. Because in order for me to reach from mu to mu, it must be the case that a bad thing did not happen. Okay, and providing that I'm using the same bin, I'm making the conclusion about the same bin. Okay.